Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Biologic Podcast. Today I'll be continuing my series on the diversity of life by exploring the, uh, the next major lineage that diverged from the protus. This green-blooded lineage is uh, that of the plants and the algae, or the green algae, I should say. So far in this series, I've covered the first life forms, the bacteria and the archaea, which cover everything in their billions and trillions. I've also covered the organisms that diverged from them and split into a huge spectrum of species collectively called the protus. The protists themselves have split into numerous groups and clades, and among them are three very successful, very diverse branches. The plants, the fungi, and the animals. Each of these kingdoms has many thousands of micro and macroscopic species that cover the globe with breathtaking diversity. I'll be covering these branches over the next three episodes, starting today with plants and algae. First things first, I should clarify that by algae, I mean specifically green algae. Although green algae are technically considered protists, they're the direct ancestors to land plants. Both green algae and land plants belong to a clade called the green plants, also known as the Verita plantea. The green plants share a common ancestry that makes itself clear in the qualities that are shared across the clade. Both green algae and plants perform photosynthesis with similar patterned arrangements of organelles called thylakoids. They share many of the same proteins, like beta-carotene and the enzymes chlorophyll A and B. They have similar cell walls, similar sperm gametes, similar organelles, and they both use starch as an energy storage molecule. The genetic similarities confirm the close evolutionary relationship between green algae and land plants. The green algaes most closely related to the land plants are known to live in freshwater ponds and lakes, and this kind of gives us a clue into the origin, or the, uh, the evolutionary emergence, of land plants. The first green algae, and thus the common ancestor for all green plants, came about a little over 700 million years ago, give or take. The first green algae species spent about two to two and a half million centuries, diversifying and expanding across the world's floodplains, lakes, and rivers. Understand that the, the first green algae are the single-celled microbes that typically possess two flagella, and they'd go through their life cycles by forming colonies of reproducing cells. These colonies formed macroscopic structures that resemble little green blobs or growths. The ulvophytes came first, being little more than small green blobs with a curious shape or pattern. The coleocheides diverged, and the caryophytes diverged from them. These lineages of green algae were becoming more and more plant-like, with some of the caryophytes even showing cellular differentiation in their colonial structures. And this evolutionary pattern kind of continued, until the first land plants actually emerged. The evidence of these first plants comes in the form of fossilized spores and the sporangia that created them, some 475 million years old. The first land plants were small, uh, small, non-vascular organisms, kind of like mosses and liverworts. Because these plants lacked vascular tissue, they could only move water through their bodies through diffusion, and because diffusion can only lift water up so high, uh, it greatly limited their size. They were reduced to small you know, thumb-sized or fingernail-sized structures. But they did possess a useful adaptation called a cuticle, which is a waxy layer of material that's secreted onto the surface of the plant, like usually on its leaves. The cuticle is like a, a watertight seal, and this helps the plants to avoid water loss. It, like, seals in the moisture. This would have been a critically important feature in the first organisms that moved from the oceans onto dry land as well as the organisms that didn't have veins and they couldn't risk drying out. You know, a lot of fungus are very vulnerable to drying out because they have so much surface area and they don't have cell walls or any of these things like a cuticle to protect them. However, the cuticle does come with a distinct disadvantage. While it seals in water, by the same mechanism it blocks gas exchange between the plant and the atmosphere. This blocked gas exchange is analogous to somebody just wrapping a bunch of saran wrap around your mouth and nose so you can't breathe. Like, that's not helping you, that's not good for you, and you know, it's not good for the plant either. And so this led to another evolutionary adaptation with a, a structure called the stomata. The stomata are like little holes, or pores, 
and they're bordered by these two bean-shaped guard cells that can be open or closed. When the guard cells are pumped full of water, they tighten and they distort. You know, their, their bodies are, their membranes are rigid and held tightly. The distortion they undergo when they're filled with water causes them to bend, and this opens the pore, and it allows gases to flow into and out of the plant tissue. And the pore is big enough that it, it interrupts the waxy layer of the cuticle, so the hole goes all the way into the plant tissue. And when the guard cells are dehydrated, you know, when, when all the water is pulled out of them, the pore closes and no gas exchange occurs. So while the evolution of the cuticle was critically important for plants, you know, in order to, for them to, uh, to move onto dry land, the evolution of the stomata was equally important, as it allowed the plants to continue breathing. All of these non-vascular land plants remained relatively small and simple for nearly 60 million years. They were confined to the wet areas nearest a lake or a river. This was until they began to undergo an evolutionary explosion of their own, much like the Cambrian explosion was to the diversity of animals in the ocean. At the start of the Devonian period, the land plants went through a brief window of intense diversification, where virtually all the major features of modern plants emerged. The green algae, which previously had been little more than exotic green lumps and stalk-like growths, had evolved vascular structures in their tissues that allowed them to transport water more efficiently over longer distances. These water and sugar transporting veins were critically important to the future evolution of land plants because they provided two extremely useful functions. The first vascular tissue was little more than a few tube-shaped cells, all stacked on top of one another, and this created a, a relatively efficient corridor for water transport. But because they weren't reinforced, they couldn't hold very much water, you know, they couldn't grow very large. Now, the molecule lignin is really strong for its weight, and it was first adapted, first evolved in plants, to reinforce these water-conducting cells to give them some structural support and enabling them to form actually strong, sturdy uh, cellular pipes that could run through the length of the plant. As the vascular tissue evolved, it became stronger, packed with more lignin. It was able to support more water and more weight. Really strong plant tissues, like woods, uh, they tend to be packed with lignin. You know, and this is the case when you have bundles of thousands of these vascular pipes, of these tubes of cells, all running parallel all just packed with thick layers of lignin. This is like the case in a, in a tree trunk, or like you would have in the case of, a, of the trunk and branches of a tree. Wood is as strong and sturdy as it is because the ordered columns of cells in the vascular tissue are all lined with a huge amount of lignin. In vascular tissues with less lignin, the plant can be held aloft against the forces of gravity simply by the pressure of water flowing through its veins. This is why some plants will start to wilt or droop when they're dehydrated, as they don't have the internal uh, water pressure, the internal flow of pressurized water to keep the stem and the branches at a, uh, at, a, at a healthy rigidity. Anyways, the evolution of leaves increased the surface area of plant tissue capable of performing photosynthesis, and this enabled them to produce more energy and create more sugars to sustain their growth. In addition to the leaves, the plants began evolving various pigments and flavonoids to protect their DNA from the intense ultraviolet radiation from the sun. In this regard, life in the water was much safer, as UV radiation could only penetrate the uppermost layers of the water. They call it the photic zone, because that's the only area that light photons can actually reach, and it's the only place in the, in the ocean water, or in lake water, that photosynthetic life can survive. And so when the plants moved uh, from the ocean, from the photic zone, onto dry land, they were exposed to the punishing glare of the sun with none of the protections offered by the water, and so they were forced to evolve their own defenses. The evolution of root tissue allowed plants to tap into the water and nutrients hidden deeper in the soil. Altogether, these adaptations enabled the plants to take in more nutrients and more light, to grow larger and to become more complex and more hardy against the rigors of life on land. Along with their newly evolved traits, the land plants would undergo major radiations, expanding away from the lakes and rivers to adapt to drier and more hostile environments. The first vascular plants to emerge were the lycophytes, which are today small, simple plants that reproduce by releasing spores into the environment. 
The spores are part of a cycle called the alternation of generations, which is a reproductive strategy common in protists, green algae, and many plants, but I'll describe it more in a few minutes. The species of lecophytes alive today are all pretty small, but when they were the only land plants on Earth, you know, millions of years ago, they could grow to the size of modern-day trees. In time, a group of plants called the ferns diverged from the lycophytes, you know, about 360 million years ago, and they diversified to produce lineages like the whisk ferns and the horsetails. All of these seedless plants existed in a fascinating evolutionary window called the Carboniferous Period. The land plants had emerged, and they brought with them lignin, and it meant that they could grow and reproduce, and, uh, and cover the landscape. But the bacteria and the fungus and the organisms that could decompose the lignin, they hadn't emerged yet. Because there was no lignin before the land plants, there wasn't really any evolutionary pressure to evolve something that could break down lignin. And so it took a few million years for, uh, for something that could break down lignin to, uh, to evolve, to emerge. As a result of the seedless plants living and dying, their bodies accumulated on the swampy forest floors without decomposing. Over time, this created massive piles of lingering plant tissue. And over geologic periods of time, these were compressed under layers of rock and soil. The pressure crushed the plant tissue, and it converted all the carbon into rich deposits of coal. The coal fields in North Carolina were all once forests that formed, thrived, and died in the Carboniferous period, their bodies going millions of years without being decomposed. So far in their evolutionary history, all the plants that have emerged on Earth have been confined to humid environments like wetlands, swamps, and the coasts of lakes and rivers. A big reason why seedless plants never got very far outside of their humid habitats is because their spores can't handle the extreme dryness. Without enough water in the air, the spores just dry out, and they become withered husks that are unable to fertilize anything or reproduce. So, for plants to move into the drier regions of the world, they needed a way to reproduce that wasn't dependent on something as fragile as a spore. This evolutionary pressure gave rise to the seed. Beginning about 300 million years ago, the first gymnosperms, or seed-bearing plants, emerged with their seed-based method of replication. The seed was a, a hardier method of reproduction. It could endure greater temperature extremes and lower humidity than a typical spore, and this enabled the gymnosperms to grow in drier areas that the seedless plants could not like mountainous terrain or the dry expanses of inner continental land. For the first time in Earth's history, the land plants spread out to cover the near entirety of the planet's available land surface. Where the plants grew freely, they crafted an environment more accommodating and hospitable to the animal life that would follow, turning the brutal mineral crust into a verdant habitat lush with green plants and rich soils. For nearly 150 million years, the gymnosperms thrived. They covered the planet and diversified into thousands of distinct species, with an enormous variety in their morphologies and their ecological roles. But in time, the reign of the gymnosperms came to an end, as they began to face competition from the newly emerged angiosperms. The angiosperms are the most recent evolutionary shift in the world of plants, and it involved the, uh, the emergence of flowers. So angiosperms are the flowering plants, and they use a, a kind of flowering structure, you know, the flower, as part of their reproduction. The angiosperm lineage is really diverse, and it includes species as small as grasses, and those as large as maple trees and oak trees, as well as all the obvious flowering plants like tulips, sunflowers, roses, orchids, violets, amaryllis, daffodils, and daisies, among many, many, many others. The angiosperms are also different from the gymnosperms in how they store and distribute their seeds. Where the gymnosperms produce seeds exposed to the elements and dispersed randomly along the ground or, in, or stuck in the fur of some passing animal, the angiosperms wrapped their seeds in fruit. The fruit structure is a tasty and nutritious envelope for the seeds, and it provides a number of advantages. Animals are attracted to the fruit, and they'll come by and eat it, and when they eat it, you know, they also ingest the seeds, and the seeds pass through the animal's digestive tract. As the animal moves or flies around after eating, it will inevitably poop out the seeds at some distance away from the parent plant. 
This animal-assisted transportation helps the plant species spread and radiate across geographic space. If the fruit falls from the plant without being eaten, the seeds have a chance to germinate in the soil. As the fruit decays, its rotting body leaks nutrients into the soil, which gives a, a boost, like a nutritious boost, to the young seeds. While fruits are certainly useful, they're also easy for parasites and other moocher species to exploit. The sugary fruit can be infected with mold, or it can be used by various arthropod species to their exclusive advantage. When a fruit is hollowed out and used by an insect as a site to store its eggs, or when insects just straight up eat the fruit, the fruit is getting consumed, but the seeds aren't going anywhere. The plant isn't getting a benefit, even though it's investing all these resources in growing the fruit, while the insect is exploiting its tissue for free resources. So now that I've covered the history of plant evolution, I want to look at a few of the themes that defined and shaped this evolution. The growth and evolution of all organisms is dependent on their limiting factors, on the things they need to grow and survive that happen to come in limited supply, and thus induce some kind of selective pressure upon them. The most important resources for land plants are light, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, all of which can be difficult to access in certain circumstances. Carbon dioxide, for example, cycles with the seasons. The available carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases during the winter when plants are dying and decaying. And the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere decreases during the summer when plants are extracting that carbon dioxide to fuel their photosynthesis and to produce the sugars that they need to grow and reproduce. Nitrogen is another one of these limiting resources, because it's integral to the stem and the leaf and the flowering tissues of all the plants. Even though uh, nitrogen is in the atmosphere, it doesn't cycle in quite the same way as carbon, because the molecular nitrogen just isn't immediately bioavailable. Most plants just don't have the chemical resources necessary to break the triple bond that's in, uh, in molecular nitrogen. However, nitrogen-reducing fungi do. Because of this, plants have evolved symbiotic relationships with these fungi, who give them bioaccessible nitrogen in return for sugars. Lastly, phosphorus is also one of these resources that, uh, that fungi help supply to plants. Because phosphorus is pretty water-soluble, it can be easily washed out of the soil during rain or uh, flooding or something like that. And if a plant has access to a, a symbiotic fungus that can feed it phosphorus, a fungus that can retain phosphorus or harvest it from the soil in places that the plant couldn't reach, then uh, having that symbiotic partner is a benefit for the plant. Lastly, the light from the sun is perhaps the most important resource for land plants, and yet it can be challenging to acquire. In places with dense vegetation like a rainforest, the tree canopy can be so thick that little to no light reaches the forest floor below, even at noon on a summer day. Taller plants can enjoy uninterrupted light from the sun, so they have to prioritize ways of protecting themselves from sunburn and water loss from evaporation. This evolutionary pressure encourages the evolution of a large number of smaller leaves. Shorter plants have the opposite pressure, a lack of regular or reliable light. And this lack of light encourages the evolution of fewer leaves. However, each leaf is relatively large, and it's dark with high concentrations of photosynthetic pigments. This larger leaf with more photosynthetic enzymes enables the shorter plants to grab and process as much light as they can, you know, any light that they're exposed to on the heavily shaded forest floor. Okay, so do you remember the alternation of generations that I mentioned earlier? This is a method of reproducing that involves shifting back and forth between two different reproductive states, like a sporophyte or a gametophyte. It exists in many protist species, and it also exists in all land plants. Before I get started on describing how plants reproduce, I want to start with two evolutionary adaptations that greatly helped land plants colonize and thrive on dry land. The first adaptation is the development of a structure called a gametangia. This structure physically holds and protects the gametes, much like the ovaries and the testes in animals. In plants, however, the male gametangium is called an antheridium, while the female version is called an archegonium, 
All land plants have these structures except for the angiosperms, which instead have structures inside their flowers that serve the same purpose. Where protists and water-dwelling plants just spill their gametes out into the surrounding environment, the land plants store their gametes in the gametangia, protecting them from their harsher, drier environment. This takes me to the second major adaptation, which involves the archegonium, the female gamete storage structure. By holding the eggs instead of just spilling them out into the environment, the plant can nourish and protect the young zygote after it's been fertilized. You see, when most algaes and protists have their eggs fertilized to form a zygote, the zygote detaches from the parent's body, or it forms away from the parent's body entirely. In land plants, the fertilized egg is retained on the plant's body. It's not let go, and this allows the plant to continue feeding the zygote for some time. A zygote with ensured nutrition like that is that much healthier, and it's that much more likely to survive and reproduce. Alright, now that that's said, let's get back to the alternation of generations. This is a life cycle, or a, a reproductive cycle, that involves a haploid stage and a diploid stage, or stages where the organism has, in their cells, one or two copies of their genome, respectively. The haploid stage, where the organism's uh, cells just have one copy of the genome, uses spores to create a gametophyte, or an individual in the cycle that produces gametes. The diploid stage, where the organism cells have two copies of the genome, uses these gametes to create a sporophyte, or an individual in the cycle that produces spores. So gametes create a sporophyte, which creates spores through meiosis. The spores go out and replicate asexually through mitosis to create a male or a female gametophyte. This produces gametes, and these gametes fertilize each other to produce a zygote. The zygote then grows into a sporophyte, which releases spores, and the cycle starts all over again. Land-plant replication is a perpetual back and forth between the sporophyte and the gametophyte stages. What differentiates plants is how long they spend in each stage. Some plants are sporophyte dominant, meaning they spend the majority of their reproductive cycle in the sporophyte stage, while others are the opposite, they're gametophyte dominant and they spend most of their time in the gametophyte stage. For example, mosses tend to be gametophyte dominant. They spend the vast majority of their time in the gametophyte stage. When their gametes fertilize and form a zygote, the zygote stays on the female gametophyte, and then it grows off of it. The emerging sporophyte is dependent on the gametophyte for nutrition, and the sporophyte only lasts long enough to produce the spores, before it dies and falls off or withers away. In contrast to your typical moss, the typical fern is sporophyte dominant. The large fern plant you would see on your typical nature hike is in the sporophyte stage. They release spores, which form really tiny gametophytes. The gametophytes in the ferns are almost like a checkpoint, existing only briefly to ensure that the gametes fertilize into a zygote, which then immediately begins growing into another macroscopic fern, or a sporophyte. Most later plants, like gymnosperms and angiosperms, are also sporophyte dominant, which kind of suggests that there was a major evolutionary shift in the Verita plantea clade to favor the sporophyte stage over the gametophyte stage. Why this is, I'm not quite sure. The sporophytes can be heterosporous or homosporous, which are labels explaining how their spores form the gametophytes. In homosporous plants, they produce a single kind of spore, and this develops into a hermaphroditic gametophyte. This hermaphroditic gametophyte produces both male and female gametes, and these gametes can fertilize the gametes from another plant, or they can undergo self-fertilization. On the other hand, the heterosporous plants produce two distinct types of spores. Uh, they have microspores, which become males, and megaspores, which become females. The microspores in particular underwent a unique evolutionary change. In the water, the plant sperm cells would swim from individual to individual. But on dry land, this watery travel corridor doesn't exist. There isn't enough water to deliver swimming sperm from one plant to another. So on dry land, the plants adapted to use the wind instead of the ocean currents to spread their seed. The sperm cells evolved into pollen, which are lighter and able to withstand drier conditions. 
The pollen can float on the wind, or be carried on the feathers of a bird or on the fur of an animal, which helps propel the heterosporous land plants into drier habitats away from the humid, water-saturated habitats of their ancestors. Seeds were another major evolutionary adaptation that I already touched on. The seed has a fertilized embryo surrounded by a packet of nutritious tissue. When the seed germinates, the young plant consumes the nutritious tissue for an energy boost, kind of like the amniotic sac in a pregnant amniote animal. In the case of seeds, the sporophyte produces haploid microsporangia, which fertilize the haploid megasporangia, and this creates a diploid seed embryo. The seed grows into a sporophyte, like a mature hardwood tree, which then starts the cycle over again by producing gametes. Remember how earlier I said that flowers use similar but different structures? Instead of an antheridium and an archegonium, flowers use things called, uh, called a stamen and carpels, which produce the sperm and the eggs, respectively. I won't get into too much detail on it because the process is really complicated and not very well understood, but flowers undergo a type of double fertilization, where the first fertilization creates the actual zygote, and the second fertilization creates a triploid tissue called the endosperm. The endosperm is the nutritious tissue in the seed that gets consumed by the young germinating plant. It's kind of interesting that the endosperm only exists after a, a weird second fertilization event. Like it's some kind of sister growth that also has to be fertilized, but its purpose isn't to grow into an organism, it's just to become a, a lump of gooey nutrients. The flowers of the angiosperms are like really ornate decorations that evolved in a symbiotic relationship with specific pollinators. A given species of pollinator, like a, a bee, is attracted to certain colors and scents and shapes, and the various species of flowering plants that bees pollinate have evolved flowers that try to maximize their appeal for the bee. They're like advertisements or lures trying to bring in a pollinator, trying to bring it in close to help the plant reproduce. The pollinators come to the flower, attracted by its color and scent, and they begin to collect sugary water that has kind of been retained on the flower's tissues, on the, on the petals. While physically present on the flower, the pollinator gets coated in pollen. As the pollinator gets its fill and flies off to another plant, some of this pollen gets shaken off, and it fertilizes the megasporangia. This symbiotic relationship is extremely important for most ecosystems with flowering plants as they've been shaped by evolution over millions of years to be in a near-perfect homeostasis. The bee pollinating the flowering plant is a famous textbook example of the ecological role of plants, although it should be understood that plants do far more than just attract bees with pretty flowers. Green plants are absurdly important for a healthy ecology, simply because they do so much for everything else. Not only do plants perform multiple critical functions for habitat stability, their physical bodies also become part of the ecology for everything else. Most importantly, plants produce molecular oxygen through photosynthesis. Recall when I discussed the cyanobacteria and their capacity for photosynthesis. The chemical reaction involves electrons from water reducing carbon dioxide, producing sugars and molecular oxygen. This oxygen goes into the atmosphere, and it makes the oxygen that we breathe. Well, all of the green plants are photosynthetic too, and they all pump oxygen into the atmosphere as their cells use light to power photosynthesis and to power their respiration. Places with really dense vegetation, like the Amazon rainforest, have been colloquially referred to as the lungs of our planet, due to the sheer quantity of biomass taking in carbon dioxide and expelling oxygen through this process of photosynthesis. Despite the size of the Amazon, and the size of other important rainforests like the Congo in Africa, the Valdivian in South America, and the Dane tree in Australia, um, despite all of the plants there, the blue-green algae called the cyanobacteria produce more oxygen than them all. Keep in mind that plants don't produce as much oxygen during the winter, they don't cover the entirety of the dry land, and all the dry land only covers around a quarter of the earth. Meanwhile, the cyanobacteria live in the oceans, which cover three-quarters of the planet, and the only thing preventing them from getting sunlight is the clouds and the depth of the water they happen to be floating in. All things considered, plants are kind of at a disadvantage when it comes to competing with cyanobacteria for oxygen production. 
But oxygen production isn't the only chemical trick that plants have up their sleeve. They also support ecosystem stability by holding and retaining water. Water has a high heat capacity, which means it can absorb and hold a lot of heat. In humid areas, where the air is thick with water vapor, the heat accumulated throughout the day is retained through the night, and this is what makes nighttime in the tropics so comfortable and warm. In drier regions, where there's a lot less water vapor in the air, it can get really hot during the day, but it gets very cold at night, and it's because there isn't enough water in the air to retain the heat. Plants are able to hold water in the ecosystem in a number of ways. Their leaves can intercept raindrops, which softens their landing. This might seem unimportant, but it's critical for the stability of the soil. Heavy rains on weak soil can easily bust it all up and wash it all downhill, or flush out all the nutrients. The heavy rain will just flush everything downstream. But the leaves will soften the impact of the rain and help protect the landscape. By protecting against washout, the plants help retain nutrients and the stability of the topsoil. The physical body of the plant, like the stems and the leaves and any flowers it happens to have, will also interrupt the wind, and this serves the same purpose for kind of keeping water vapor around. In areas with dense vegetation, the wind gets deadened by the cumulative resistance of a forest full of leaves and branches and trunks getting in the way. Without wind to blow the water vapor away, the water vapor will just kind of linger around. The roots are a really underappreciated part of the plant, because the roots are also critical for soil stability. The physical network of roots branches wildly underground and grows to a massive size, spreading not just across the topsoil, but also penetrating deep into the ground where they can reach deeper sources of water. These meshes of roots have a physical structure that helps retain water and hold the soil together. This inherent stability makes it possible for all manner of organisms, like insects, rodents, birds, and lizards, to burrow into the soil and make their habitat there, make burrows or nests or what have you. And this allows for more diversity in the habitat, for more complexity in the local ecology. Besides retaining water, softening the wind, and stabilizing the soil, plants are also a fundamental part of the food chain. Because they absorb energy directly from the sun, the plants are called primary producers. They basically transform light energy directly into bioaccessible chemical energy in the form of sugars and the stuff that composes their bodies. And so when herbivores come and eat the plant tissue, when they eat the leaves and the stems and the flowers and stuff like that, they incorporate some of that chemical energy into their own bodies. And in the same way, when carnivores and predators come along and eat the herbivores, they take some of the remaining chemical energy for themselves. You know, they take some of the chemical energy in the herbivore's body, and they ingest it into their own. And this goes on, you know, so on and so forth, up the food chain. Plants make all of this possible by taking energy and nutrients directly from the natural environment and converting them into raw biomass that sustains virtually every other species of land animal, from insects to tree frogs to rhinoceroses. The emergence of green algae and land plants onto the dry crust of the young earth, it created a terrestrial environment that was really hospitable for the animal life that would follow. Like a complex symphony with instruments and melodies clashing and interacting with one another, the animals used the plants as food, as habitats or shelter, or for any other purpose. And over evolutionary lengths of time, the plants and animals formed symbiotic relationships. They formed ecological homeostasis, where the life cycle or behavior of one species is dependent on the body or behavior or life cycle of another species. And all of this evolved so it kind of worked in tandem in a balanced, perpetual, organic cycle. The history of the evolution of green plants is a story of aquatic life adapting to the rugged, dry conditions of life on land. This story is told through the evolutionary changes apparent in more than 400 million years of evolution. I wish I could have gone into more detail on a lot of this stuff, like the alternation of generations, the symbiotic relationships plants create with animals, with fungi and other plants, and the high degree of ecological utility that plants provide. But I had to parse everything down to fit it into a practical timescale.
In future episodes, I'll be exploring the lives of plants in much greater detail. So if this episode interested you, be sure to stay up to date with the podcast so you can catch future episodes that will cover in detail things like plant physiology, nutrition, and reproduction. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up or hit the like button. Make a comment or send it to a friend or a classmate to enjoy. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.